it. Okay. Just kidding. Okay. So let's talk about myelination. This is a very important um, um, substance that is actually made that coats our cells that actually allows something that's fast to become even faster, meaning myelination or myelinated cells are, uh, will be a faster conducting type of cell. So we're going to talk about how that occurs here, but we're going to discuss how it basically will wrap itself around an axon. All right, so first, when we talk about myelin, you need to understand that it is a high-fat, high-lipid substance. Okay, so on gross appearance, all right, when we're looking at nervous tissue that's myelinated, it will have a white appearance to it. And its job is to insulate the axon, and it'll speed up, all right, the conduction of the action potential. All right, so generally, myelinated nerves or axons will conduct a faster action potential. So the cells that actually produce the myelin are glial cells, and we talked about those on Tuesday. And the um, peripheral nervous system, those are our neural lemocytes or the Schwann cells. And the central nervous system, those are the oligodendrocytes. So in the uh, central nervous system, those oligodendrocytes would shoot the processes off of the cell body, and they could uh, um, cover multiple axons. But when we're dealing with the peripheral nervous system, our Schwann cells or neural lemocytes, I can only cover one individual axon here. Okay? So, and that's basically their job when we're talking about jumping into the peripheral nervous system here. The Schwann cell is going to cover a portion of the axon, all right? And that covering we refer to as the myelin sheath, all right? Which is actually, you know, the cell itself, too, all right? But we refer to it as the myelin, myelin sheath. And it's interesting because as all right, the uh, neural lemocyte wraps itself <clears throat> around all right, the axon, it squeezes the cytoplasm and the contents of the cytoplasm further and further out to the periphery here. Okay? So, uh, again, you'll understand it more when I show you the picture. All right? So, an interesting fact is, all right, these neural lemocytes, all right, can only myelinate one millimeter of an axon. Now, remember, I told you some neurons can span the entire length of your arm, so it can span the entire length of your leg, all right? So imagine how many neural lemocytes are going to be along that axon, and how many thousands of axons will be found in a nerve fascicle, and how many nerve fascicles make up a neuron, okay? So we saw when we were labeling last week, last week, last class, right? So here's your axon, right? And then you'll have these neural lemocytes that will wrap themselves around, along the axon here. And we have, all right, these spaces in between, okay? And those are the neural fibril nodes, but we also call those the nodes of Ron VA, okay? That's going to be right there in between. All right, so here you can see, I'll zoom in a little bit so we can kind of, nothing terribly exciting, but just somewhat interesting. And here, here's our Schwann cell, and it starts to slowly wrap itself around, all right, about a millimeter of, of real estate along the axon here. And you can see as we progress down, as it's wrapping around, all right, the nucleus is getting pushed further away from the axon off to the periphery, all right, and then the inner layers here, are kind of squeezing the cytoplasm and its contents further away from the axon, further out to the periphery here, and as it keeps going and going until eventually all right, it's encased that axon around several layers here, all right, and that right there creates the myelin sheath. And you can see how the, the, um, the nucleus is smushed out to the side, out to the periphery there but it creates this nice insulation padding here so we can conduct the, the uh, action potential faster. And I'll talk about how that works, okay? <clears throat> all right, so here you can see the neural lemocytes just littered all along the axon here with the neural fibril nodes here, the nodes of Ron VA in between. 
right, and then all the way at the end. But notice also what parts of the cell are not myelinated. Okay, the receptive segment, which is the cell body and the dendrites, are not myelinated. So on gross inspection of nervous tissue, if it looks, if it's white, we said it's myelinated tissue. And the only areas of a cell that are going to be myelinated are the axon. So if you see white tissue, or what we call white matter, right, that's all myelinated axons. If you see gray matter, it's either unmyelinated axons or cell bodies, all right, and the dendrites here in glial cells. Okay, so it's really easy. If it's, if it's white matter, it's myelinated axons, and then gray matter is everything else. <clears throat> okay, so we see here in our central nervous system, all right, here's the illegal dendrocyte here, and it's shooting off multiple processes that is going to wrap itself around, all right, at the axons, all right, up in the central nervous system. All right. Similarly, it's going to be able to myelinate about one millimeter, all right, but at the same time, all right, it can, multi, it can uh, hit several different areas, okay? It's not just stuck, all right, in between or just on one axon. It can hit several different axons, and it can hit the same axon in, in, in several locations, okay? It just can't... Um, myelinate like here and then myelinate all the way down here okay it's just too far for it all right so you can kind of see here the difference all right between the peripheral nervous system myelination all right and the central nervous system myelination here all right and then we have our unmyelinated axons all right and again like i said keep in mind all right your nerve signal is going to travel slower. It's still fast, but it's going to be slower in the unmyelinated axon compared to our myelinated axon. All right. Um, regeneration, okay? If we're in the peripheral nervous system, the axons, believe it or not, can regenerate in the peripheral nervous system, all right? But you have to have an intact cell body. Okay, a lot of the protein production for uh, the, the parts of the cell are in the cell body, endoplasmic reticulum, the ribosomes and whatnot, all right? And we also need enough of our neural lemma to, to remain intact, okay? So what makes it more likely for regeneration to occur is if you sever all right, a neuron, okay, if the gap in between the two severed ends is is fairly small all right in distance all right then the two severed ends are have a higher likelihood of connecting back to each other all right and uh reconnecting okay so obviously if there's less damage and if the distance between all right the area of the damage is shorter then regeneration is much likelier okay um, you should be familiar with this term here, Wallerian de uh, degeneration, okay? So basically what happens is when the axon is cut, all right, so you have two ends here, all right? All right, like I said, it's better to have a shorter distance here than it is that longer distance here, all right? So if this is the, where the cell body is, okay, the proximal end, all right, all right, it's going to seal itself off and create this nice swelling area that occurs here. And then what down here at the distal end, all right, we're going to see all right, the connection where we're going to start to have this, what we call the regeneration tube, all right, in which we're trying to reconnect the two areas here. And anyone here, oh, I cannot remember the name of the, it'll come to me. It's a neurological, I don't want to call it a neurological, a neurocyst, but there's, if anyone has ever had like a, a painful cyst, that it's usually found around areas of neurons, uh, not neurons, but nerves. I want to say it's a Morton cyst, but it's not the name of it. Um, in which this type of scenario occurs where you get all these uh, regeneration tubes, but they don't necessarily go straight across. They kind of fan out, and it creates 
kind of um, this pain sensitive or pressure sensitive region here of the neuron when you press on it it actually causes discomfort um, sorry y'all I can't remember the name of it all right um, and then finally when we talk about the central nervous system all right in that situation with the central nervous system we're not for the most part, we're not going to see regeneration. That's why damage to the spinal cord and to, well, if you sever your spinal cord or damage uh, specific regions of the spinal cord, like, uh, does anyone remember Christopher Reeves? Or Reeve? Christopher, he was Superman, the original Superman, way back in the 80s. Well, he played polo. He had a part of electric playing polo and crazy sport. And uh, he fell off the horse and fell on his head and broke. Uh, his neck, and he's, he severed the spinal cord. I want to say it was two, C2, C3. So he was pretty much paralyzed, bound to a wheelchair, you know, lost all uh, bowel bladder function, urination, uh, had no feeling. Um, and he, uh, you, he actually lived for a pretty long time because usually the higher the area of damage to the, to the spinal cord, the less likely, the more difficult it is to survive. Especially to breathe, if you sever the spinal cord uh, above C3, because um, C3, C4, and C5 um, creates the phrenic nerve, which is the nerve that helps with the breathing of the spinal of the diaphragm, which we'll talk about in a couple chapters. But um, that situation there, I want to say he lived for about almost a decade, maybe five years. I can't remember. Um, but unfortunately, he uh, he eventually passed away from complications but um, they were talking about if they were going to do um, stem cell therapy that he would have been the one that they were going to try to, to do it with okay let's jump into um, the skeletal muscles here okay um, I'm going to start off by kind of doing um, a little bit of a explanation as to one um, why we name the muscles the way we do, why certain muscles look the way they look, all right, and um, how we describe their attachment points, what we call um, origins and insertions here. So let's start off by talking about, similar to how we did it with the skeletal system, all right, with the muscular system, we're going to break it down by regional anatomy. And so in this course, we're going to cover the axial muscles, all right, first, and that's going to be any of the muscles that either have an origin, okay, that's the less movable portion of the muscle, and an insertion, that's the more movable portion of the muscle, all right, where it's going to have both of those, all right, occur on the axial skeleton. Okay, and as you recall, the axial skeleton is going to be the head, or, or excuse me, the skull, the vertebrae, the thoracic cage, which includes the ribs and the sternum. Okay, and so it's going to go all the way down to include the sacrum and the coccyx there. Okay, so we're going to see, all right, that these muscles, since they're part of the axial skeleton, yes, the primary function of a muscle is, or skeletal muscle is movement. Time you think of a muscle, you want to think movement. So that being said, all right, in the axial uh, muscles here, they're going to move, all right, parts of the axial skeleton, which is the head, all right. And the spinal uh, column, all right, and also they play a huge role in support, like posture right now. Okay, you're engaging several of your axial muscles just to sit upright to keep your head upright. Okay, not only that, when since we're talking about the head, we're going to talk about your your neck, scalp, and face. So some of these axial muscles are involved in all right facial expression, all right breathing. And then mastication, chewing and swallowing. Okay. Now they do play a limited role because if you recall, all right, you've got your thoracic cage to protect a lot of your organs, all right, in your chest. All right, but what's protecting your small intestines, all right, or your large intestines, all right, or in your ab abdominal area? Nothing really. So they do play a small role in protection of your abdominal organs and your pelvic organs too, okay? 
Appendicular muscle are way easier to know. What do they do? They move your upper and lower limbs, okay? And they attach onto your pelvic and pectoral girdles, right? So they're going to influence the movement of both of those sets of girdles there. So we'll get into a little bit more detail about how we uh, organize these different muscle groups. Because, for example, like your forearm, you've got muscles on the anterior portion of your forearm that flex your hand and wrist and fingers, and we call that the flexor compartment. Okay, and then on the back side of your forearm, you've got muscles that extend your hand and wrist and fingers, right? And we call those the extensor compartment muscles. So that's what we're talking about here when we organize them into their groups based on their locations. All right, so quick peek here. Here's the anterior view. We're going to be learning a lot of these muscles here. All right, good news is it's not going to be as much as the bones, all right? So you're not going to have to learn about 300 structures, okay? Um, <clears throat> The bad news is for some folks, it's a little bit more difficult to learn these terms, all right? But I'm going to try to walk you through it and help to explain to you why we name these muscles the way we do here. All right, well, if we're talking about muscles, we cannot leave out the tendons, okay? Tendons are our dense, regular connective tissue that are going to attach muscles mainly to bone, but guess what? They can also attach muscles to the skin and to another muscle, all right? So we saw on Tuesday when we started to do our labeling, we talked about the frontalis muscle, that muscle on your forehead. It attaches to the back portion of, of your scalp to a muscle called occipitalis. And those muscle, that, the whole muscle um, apparatus is connected all right, by a connective tissue called the aponeurosis. And basically what the aponeurosis is, it's a flat tendon all right, that in this case, we called it the gala aponeurotica that attached those two muscle bellies to both. All right, but keep in mind your aponeurosis is just a small, I shouldn't say small, but thin, flattened tendon. Okay? So, as you know, the primary uh, function of muscles is movement. And for movement to occur, we need to have an articulation, all right, to be present. So most muscles will cross at least one joint. Some will cross two, all right? Perfect example, the gastrocnemius muscle. That's a muscle down in your, on the back side, your calf muscle. It crosses over, all right, your ankle joint and your knee joints. Um, they've done studies and found out that when people go in to get a knee replacement, if prior to the knee replacement surgery, they do physical therapy, and is anyone doing physical, planning on do, going into physical therapy here? Okay. Um, prior to physical therapy, if they strengthen their leg musculature, you know, the muscles that influence the knee, right, their recovery from a knee replacement is that much better, because I've seen more people have difficulty with knee replacements than they do hip replacements, and you figured it wouldn't be that case, but knees are just, they just give more people issues. Point being is, um, most people don't consider the gastrocnemius muscle, the calf muscle, to affect the knee, but it actually does. So that's one of the muscles that they try to uh, rehab or increase its muscle strength so they can stabilize the joint more. Okay, so when we talk about the attachment sites for the axial muscles, all right, we'll see all right, what we call a superior attachment and an inferior attachment. Um, now, when I was in school, they were going to get rid of uh, the terms origin and insertion. This is a while ago. An origin and insertion is going to be similar to the superior and inferior attachment. Okay? The origin is the less movable portion. So you'll hear the, an old term, all right, uh, origin of this muscle, all right, would be uh, the less movable area, and the insertion is going to be the more movable area. But we are starting to use some different terms here now, uh, attachment sites. So when we're talking about the axial muscles, the superior attachment site is going to be the more movable area. The inferior attachment site is going to be the less movable. Now when we talk about the appendicular or the, or the muscles of your limbs, all right, the proximal attachment site is going to be the less movable. All right, and then the distal is going to be the more movable. So if you look here on our picture, right, here, and I know this is a picture of the appendicular skeleton, but this right here is the proximal attachment site, what we used to call the origin, right? 
it's less movable when we're dealing with the biceps brachii muscle, the muscle that causes you to bend your elbow. Right? When you go to flex your elbow, because it attaches on to the radial tuberosity down here on the radius there, right? it flexes the elbow. That's the more movable portion. Okay? But that is also more distal. Okay? So the distal is more movable, and that's what we used to call the insertion. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to talk to you folks about uh, muscle patterns. This is very important because, as you know, skeletal muscle is striated. Okay, and we'll talk about how what gives it its striations, but it's the the contractile proteins of the sarcomere. All right, but on gross inspection, all right, this 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 striation characteristic, all right causes us to see what we call uh, the fascicles, right? And that's this, this pattern of these muscle fibers, right? And so there are different organizational types that we name, right? And this will help you to, one, understand all right, what their function is. And when we start to get to the naming portion, it should make it a little bit easier. All right, so there's four ways, all right, that we um, classify the fascicle arrangement here for the muscle fibers. The first one is circular. We saw this when we were uh, labeling the orbicularis oris and the uh, orbicularis oculi, the internal and external fibers there. Okay, So circular muscles, I'll show you a quick picture, come right back. Here you can see the circular muscle. All right, usually they're around an opening of some sort. Okay, And these circular muscles Right, are going to be found around an opening, and in some cases, we refer to them as a sphincter. All right, remember when we were talking about the stomach, and you had the cardiac sphincter and the pyloric sphincter, right? Well, these circular muscles all right, that we saw when we were labeling the face on Tuesday, all right, allow for that opening that they surround to become smaller when they contract. All right, so in that case, like for the orbicularis oculi, um, if you squint your eyes, you're closing that opening to the eye, so you were um, contracting those circular muscle fibers there. The next type are the parallel fibers, okay? That's these guys here, that, and the example that we're seeing here is the rectus abdominal muscle, and these fibers run parallel to one another, all right? So up and down, parallel with each other. All right, now the, the nice thing about the parallel muscle fibers, all right, this type of arrangement gives a muscle more muscular endurance. Okay, not strength, but endurance. All right, so when this occurs, all right, we'll see that when the muscle contracts, what we call the central belly, which is usually the center of the, the muscle itself, will start to expand. You'll see it kind of like with the bi. The example of that would be like flexing your arm. You see the bicep muscle kind of get big when the muscle when the muscle bodybuilders are posing. All right, that belly expands because they're contracting. All right, the next type is called the convergent muscles. So all the fascicles will converge onto one point. All right, and we'll see that in the chest. An example of that is the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. Now, the nice thing about this arrangement is all right, you can move a muscle in several different um, directions because of that convergence there. Um, if you look here, you can see the pectoralis major muscle has fibers coming from the clavicle, from the sternum here, from some of the sternal cartilage or the costal cartilage. But they all converge on one point. So, and bodybuilders have uh, um, keyed into this because when they want to really uh, maximize the appearance of their pectoralis major muscle, um, they'll do three different variations of what they call the bench press. They'll lay flat on their back and do a normal flat bench press. Um, if they want to, and that'll hit the middle fibers. If they want to hit the upper fibers, they'll do an incline bench press. So they're kind of sitting up a little bit. That'll hit the upper fibers. And then if they want to do the lower fibers down here, they'll do what's called a decline bench press, and they'll lay with their head close to the ground and their feet elevated. 
point being is that allows all right movement in several different directions. The last one here, all right, is the pennate muscles. Now, pennate, think of a feather. Okay, so you'll have a tendon involved, and the fibers, all right, when they're coming off of the tendon, there's several different arrangements they can come off on. Well, let me just show you. You can have all the fibers coming off of the uh, tendon off of one side. That first one there is called a the unipennate. They all come off of one side, usually about 45 degree angle. All right, bipennate, all right, that's when you have one central tendon and then the muscle fibers usually come off at of 45 degrees on both sides. And then multipennate, you have one main tendon that gives off these small little kind of tributaries. All right, and the multipennate. Okay, you'll have off those little tribu tributaries, all right, a lot of smaller fibers coming off at 45 degrees. Okay. Um, oh, wait, I already, my bad. I'm jumping around. Wait, can I skip? There we go. Okay. So the nice thing about the pennate is because, all right, depending on the position of the fibers and their angle, it can actually uh, influence the amount of tension, all right, that's generated on, uh, that the muscle can make. So it's going to have, it's going to be stronger than the parallel muscle fibers, okay, um, but they won't have the endurance that the parallel muscle fibers have, okay. Okay, let's get into the part that uh, I think that will help you out, and then we'll do some labeling. Um, but I want to talk to you folks about how we name these muscles, because it'll help you to, 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 to understand um, when we name these muscles, why we name them, and hopefully it'll help to trigger some, uh, some of the, uh, when you're taking the test, uh, when you're looking at a muscle, if you can remember its action, or the way it's shaped, it might help you to name the muscle. So there's a couple different ways, right, that we name our muscles, okay? There's about seven different ways, actually. The first one that's listed up here is the action, all right? So if you see a muscle that has flexor or extender or pronator or supinator, all right, it tells you what it's doing. For example, the flexor digitorum longus, all right, is telling you that it's going to flex the digits, okay? Um, where we may find this muscle is another uh, way to name it, okay? For example, here we see the rectus femoris, all right? Uh, gluteus maximus. Gluteus is going to be the gluteal region on your rear end, all right? But maximus is also referring to the sides. So in some cases, we will uh, combine some of the ways to, to name some of the muscles here, all right? So when we talk about the specific body region, we're talking about where it's located. Um, the uh, muscle attachment. Uh, perfect example, the, the big one is the sternocleidoid mastoid. All right? I said this on Tuesday that this, the first two parts of this for sternocleidoid refer to the origin of the, of the muscle, all right? which is going to be the sternum and the clavicle. And then it, it inserts onto the mastoid process of the uh, temporal bone. All right, we also see uh, coracal brachialis, a muscle in your, in your arm. Attaches onto the coracoid process of the scapula. And then it also attaches onto the brachium portion of your upper extremity, which is going to be on the humerus there. All right. Uh, orientation of the muscle fibers, we saw an example of that when we were going over the types of muscle fibers, like rectus abdominis, all right, we'll see, all right, that those muscle fibers are going to be in a straight parallel fashion there, and it also is telling us where it's located. Rectus is straight, abdominis is going to be in the abdomen there, okay? Um, the muscle shape, trapezius, okay, trapezoid, that's a four-sided geog metrical structure. That's the muscle that sits on the upper portion of your back. All right? Deltoid is the muscle that sits on your shoulder and it's shaped like a triangle. Okay, quadratus lumborum, there's another one. All right, a quadrilateral structure is a four-sided structure. 
So again, you'll see that several of these muscles, we'll name them all right, after we, we like to use the, um, the uh, geometrical shape. All right, but for the example here, we saw abductor pollicis longus. This is a muscle that abducts your, your thumb, all right, but when we describe it as longus or brevis, brevis is short, all right, it's basically telling us, all right, giving us some information if it's a long muscle or a short muscle. Carpe radialis longus, carpe radialis brevis. All right, muscle size, gluteus maximus, gluteus minimus, gluteus medius. All right, again, these muscles sit in your rear end, but when we're using the term like maximus, all right, we're describing how big. Then finally, this part here, we're talking about the attachment sites and the number of muscle heads that are involved, biceps brachii. All right, biceps brachii is describing that this muscle belly, ha this muscle has two heads. All right, triceps brachii, three heads. Okay. So keep that in mind when we talk about the number of muscle bellies, we'll use terms like that. All right, let's talk about a few muscles of facial expression here. Okay, so we hit some of these. We're going to talk about a few others. Okay, and I'll let you know which ones we need to know for um, uh, identification purposes. But what you do need to know is this fact right here that um, the muscles of facial expression are innervated by cranial nerve number seven, facial nerve. All right, we'll go over the, the cranial nerves at a later date, but all these muscles, all right, that's why if you want to test somebody's facial uh, or cranial nerve number seven, facial nerve, um, you ask them to smile, ask them to frown, ask them to squint their eyes, okay? All those will uh, um, be innervated by the facial nerve and then you can tell, especially if someone has a condition called Bell's palsy, where there's an actual paralysis of the facial nerve and they can't move half of their face, a lot of people will confuse that with a stroke. And it's not to be confused with the stroke because one's what we call an upper motor neuron lesion, which is a stroke. You get something occurring up in the brain. And then Bell's palsy is more of what we call a lower motor neuron uh, 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 lesion because it's affecting a cranial nerve. The cranial nerve is a, is a lower motor neuron. We'll, we'll talk about what that all means, okay? So for right now, all right, when we talk about muscles of facial expression, that's what we're looking at. When the muscles contract, then we're going to see some sort of facial expression. So the first one here, occipital frontalis, that's that muscle we were talking about, all right, that you had to know the frontal belly and, and, uh, or frontalis and then the posterior belly or, or occipitalis there, all right. But this muscle, all right, is connected between two bellies by the gala aponeurotica or the epicranial aponeurosis there, which is that thin tendon-like sheet there. All right, the frontal belly or frontalis is going to raise your eyebrows, all right, and then the occipitalis or occipital belly is going to pull your scalp more posteriorly. Um, don't worry about uh, corrugator supercilii muscle. You don't know that one. All right, orbicularis uh, oculi, all right, that helps to close the eye, helps you to squint. We'll talk about levator palpebrae superioris, but if you dissect the word, or the name, levator, elevate, to lift up, palpebrae, all right, is your eyelid. This is your upper eyelid. So this muscle is telling you its action, so we name it after its action and actually where it's located, all right? So this muscle, when you contract it, is going to elevate your upper eyelid, open your eyelid up, okay? Um, the flared nostrils is done by nasalis, all right? Uh, Proserius, you don't need to know this, um, this muscle here, all right? But this is what's going to cause some of the wrinkling of the nose. They say in distaste. If you're, um, but regardless, prosterus is going to be found along the nasal border there. All right. So around the mouth, um, orbicularis oris. This is the one that is going to allow us to pucker our lips. All right. Le levator, uh, excuse me, depressor labii inferioris. You don't need to know. But if you look at the name of it, it says that it's going to pull your lower lip on your mouth downwards. Depressor pulling down, labii is lip, inferioris, lower lip. So depressor labii inferioris pulls down your lower lip. Depressor anguli oris, we do need to know that for lab. That's the one that makes you frown. All right. Then if we have a depressor labii inferioris, we're going to have a levator labii superioris. This is going to pull your upper lip upwards. All right. And then we have levator anguli oris. This is the one that we're going to see. It's going to be uh, to work in concert or similar to our zygomaticus major and minor. 
Okay, so when you start to smile, this helps to lift the corners of your mouth up, giving you that smile. All right, Rosaurus here, remember this is the one where pull, that pulls your, your mouth. I'm going to try my best. This is supposed to be lips. All right, Rosaurus is going to pull the corners of your mouth backwards. All right, means to laugh. All right, mentalis is going to be located down here. Remember, we saw two of those muscles coming out. That's going to help to protrude the pouty lip. All right, platissima is a cool muscle. It's the most superficial muscle on the front of your neck. All right, we don't need to know that to identify. All right, but uh, it's um, if you ever see somebody that can expand the web of their neck, they make their neck web out. That's platissima there. And then buccinator, again, it helps to compress the cheek against the teeth while you're chewing so your cheeks can help keep food over your molars so they're not slipping around the oral cavity there. You do need to know buccinator. So here you can see some of the expressions here for this gentleman. I'd love to be this model. All right. This guy right here, he's, you can see he's contracting depressor anguli or is pulling the lips down, orbicularis oculi. All right, you can see how he's closing his eyes here. With zygomaticus major and minor, he's able to elevate the corners of his mouth up and smile. Orbicularis oris, puckering the lips. Frontal belly here, all right, or frontalis for the contraction of the forehead muscles here. But look, here's platissima. Look at that thing. All right, so when you go in to do dissection, when you dissect the skin back and the, uh, the, um, the hypodermis there, you uh, the, the muscle... Immediately beneath that is the platissima here. Helps to keep kind of everything in check. Um, we're going to be talking about the extrinsic eye muscles more in Chapter 16, so I'm not going to really uh, discuss them too much here. All right, we're going to be revisiting them. But these muscles, when we refer to them as the extrinsic eye, uh, muscles, these are the muscles that are going to be on the outside of your eye. And their job is to move the eye around. All right? So there are six muscles that are involved. All right? four of which what we call the rectus muscles. So it means here's your eyeball, okay? You're going to have one on, uh, on each side, one above it, and one below it, okay? Those are going to be the rectus muscles. If our nose is over here, okay, then you're going to have two, which we call oblique, and they'll be on the inner corners here by the nose, here and here. All right. So um, the... The recti muscles, I do want to just go over those real fast. All right, medial rectus, all right, that's this guy right here. When it contracts, it's going to pull your eye inward. So like when you cross your eyes or look in towards your nose, you are exercising medial rectus. It's innervated by cranial nerve number three, ocular motor nerve. All right, the lateral rectus is going to pull your eyes outwards, all right, like you're, it's going to move your eyes towards your ears, all right. That's innervated by a different cranial nerve, cranial nerve number six, abducens. Inferior rectus, okay, helps you to look down and in, all right? That's going to be cranial nerve number three, ocular motor. Superior rectus, same thing. It's going to help you move your eye up, but also uh, inwards medially. That's also cranial nerve three. Most of the cranial, uh, most of the uh, extrinsic eye muscles are innervated by cranial nerve number three, ocular motor. The last two muscles here, the oblique muscles, inferior oblique, all right, this one here, all right, that's supposed to say elevate, by the way. Inferior oblique elevates the eye, and it turns it so it looks up and out, all right, also innervated by cranial nerve three. Superior oblique makes your eye look down and out, okay? And that's also uh, going to be uh, innervated by a different cranial nerve than what we've seen in the past, and that's going to be cranial nerve number four, which is trochlear nerve. So there's three different cranial nerves that are going to innervate all of these extrinsic eye muscles here. Like I said, we're going to hit those in a little bit more detail. All right, just a quick brush through here. Well, actually, no, because we'll talk about those. All right. um, let me hit these up real quick. All right, muscles of mastication for chewing. All right, these muscles are going to be innervated by cranial nerve number five, trigeminal nerve. All right, so the ones that you're responsible for for identification are going to be temporalis, okay, and masseter. Now, they both elevate the jaw, but temporalis 
is going to retract the jaw. What does that mean? That pulls your jaw back. Okay, so pulling your chin back towards your spine. All right, masseter is going to do the opposite. All right, in regards to uh, what temporalis does. All right, it's going to elevate, yes, but it's going to protract or push the jaw forward there. But this is the one that's the most powerful muscle for mastication. Medial and lateral pterygoids, all right, these allow all right, your jaw to swing from side to side. Okay, so they'll have that side to side movement. And usually when folks complain of, uh, uh, folks complain of TMJ, you know, the condition TMJ, all right, it's usually one of these uh, muscles that if they're uh, having an issue with the muscle is, is, is more than likely to be the cause for that. Okay. All right. Um, and one more thing. Yes, medial does help to close the mouth. Lateral, all right, uh, helps to open the mouth. Okay. The lateral will drop your jaw down. All right. So here you can see the muscles of mastication. All right, there's temporalis, relatively deep muscle, there's masseter, all right, and then we dissect those away and we get deeper in. Your lateral and medial pterygoids attach onto the pterygoid, uh, or the, um, the lateral and medial pterygoid plates, which are part of the pterygoid process on the sphenoid bone. All right, that's enough for this stuff. Let's uh, do some labeling here. Okay. All right, so now we're going to do the torso, and we're going to start off here on the front. The first structure that uh, we're going to go over is an important anatomical structure. It's not even a muscle, okay? This structure called the linea albia goes straight down the center here, all right? It is on the midline here. Okay, so it's above and below the umbilicus. If you think of the umbilicus, your belly button is the direct middle of your body. All right, the linea albia, all right, goes above it and below it. It's kind of like back in the day when you were developing as an embryo and you folded to form the humanoid. Because at one point you were you were like a di you looked like a plate, a circular plate. You were a disc. They called it the bilaminar disc. And what happens is it starts to undergo some changes. Um, and it folds in on itself. And kind of like where you fold right down the middle, that's the linea albia there. All right, let's talk about a muscle. There's the rectus abdominis. That's that parallel muscle fibers that we saw that's high in endurance. Okay, so you can see where these arrows are pointing to. That's the muscle bellies of the rectus abdominal. This is the six pack uh, uh, muscle. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to flip the model over because this is the anterior view. Now I want to look at you from the inside. So I flip it over and then you can see the rectus abdominis muscle from the inside here. And you can see there's part of the rectus abdominis muscle that's covered by this tendon. This is called the rectus sheath and there's part of it that's not. Okay. And this rectus sheath comes from, all right, these common tendons from these other muscles that we're about to talk about. All right, staying on the inside here, you can see this longer muscle up here in the thorax that is called the subcostal muscle. Actually, I should be zooming in at least one. There you can see it up here. That's the subcostal muscle. All right, so on our rectus, our, our rectus abdominis here, you can see we have these white lines that go, that go across. All right, those tendinous intersections, all right, are the attachment points for these muscle bellies, which also gives the appearance in folks that uh, exercise a lot, have really good core strength, that six-pack appearance. But at one time, there was a theory floating around that these tendinous intersections here were once thought to be ribs. It used to be believed that we had ribs that extended all the way down into our abdomen. 
It was the theory, I should say. I haven't heard anything about it lately. So I guess they threw that one in the trash. All right. External oblique muscle. This is the most uh, superficial muscle on the lateral portion of, the, of, the, of your torso here. Okay. These muscle fibers, all right, they run what we call down and in. Or anterior and medial, down and in. So I tell folks, all right, the external oblique muscle fibers run in the same direction as if you were to put your hands into your front pockets. All right, your fingers go down and in. Okay, so now what we've done is we've dissected away the external oblique and we're going a little bit deeper here. So we go to the other side of our model and here's the internal oblique. Now the internal oblique muscles go up and in. That way. All right, and then the deepest muscle on the abdominal cavity, we'll flip it over, we'll look at it from the inside, is the transversus abdominis. Now transversus is telling us the way that these muscle fibers are running. They're going along the transverse plane here. So they go from side to side, transversus abdominis. So you can kind of see, now remember on the test, you don't have to write out muscle, you can just write out M period. It's the only abbreviation that we'll accept. Okay, transversus abdominis. All right, those muscle fibers are going side to side. All right, so we're going to remain deep in the abdomen here, and we're going to flip over to the front here. You've got this one big muscle that attaches onto parts of the lumbar spine, and it runs inferiorly down towards the leg. This is called the psoas major muscle. It contributes all right, to another muscle that we'll learn later on, but it, all, it helps to form one of the most powerful hip flexors. Okay, so if I want to bring my knee up to my chest, I'm going to flex my hip, and this muscle contributes to that motion. All right. What page is this on, by the way? Does anyone know? This is 38. Okay. All right, now I am not sure where this model is in the book, but it's not on 38. I'm not sure if it's near the front or not, or more towards the back. We like to skip around a lot. I would check right up in the front. Try page like two, five, six, any of those. Yeah, the last slide? Sure. Does anyone at home know what page? <laughs> I know it's in the book. I didn't bring my atlas with me. Did you say 34? That looks 24? 44, page 44. Okay, that's page 44, folks. So you can see again on this different model, that's so as major right here. You can see it attaches on the lumbar spine and then even up towards rib 12. And it's going to just go inferiorly and it's going to head down into the leg there and it's going to help to become one of the hip flexor muscles. So as we move, we're going to just basically move more lateral here, okay? And we're going to show you quadratus lumborum. Quadratus lumborum muscle, all right, we named that after its location, lumborum for the lumbar, and the shape of the muscle is a square. You can see it a little bit better over here because so as major isn't in the way. This is all quadratus lumborum, all right? It helps right now, you're using it to keep you upright. Okay, it helps to keep you upright. If you go to bend over and you go to straighten up, when you're straightening up, you contract that muscle. If you do a side bend, you're contracting um, the ipsilateral muscle 
right, which is the same side muscle. So if I lean to the right, okay, then my right quadratus lumborum is contracting. All right, going down in here into the ilium here of the pelvis, you can see this muscle right, that sits right there in the iliac fossa, we call that iliacus. All right, now iliacus and psoas major, all right, have a very close relationship because they're going to both fuse with one another and turn into this muscle down here. But when we do the appendicular skeleton, we'll talk about that. So to be continued. All right, so here we can see, we're going to go back to page 44 and see the iliacus muscle here. You can see it here and over here. All right, that's iliacus. So when we are looking at the os coxa there, and you saw that nice smooth region on the anterior surface of the of the ilium, um, that's you were looking at the home of the iliacus muscle. All right, on the back, we got another muscle that tells you its location and its and its function here. All right. It's part of what we call the I love spaghetti muscles. The erector spinae muscle is a group of muscles that are very deep. They're, in fact, the deepest muscles all right, on, uh, on your back, okay? And they go all the way from the base of your skull all the way down to your rear end. And their job is to help keep you upright, okay? So you have another group of muscles that help to keep you upright. That's the erector spinae uh, muscle. All right, you can also see it down here a little bit. Now, this is a nice view of trapezius because it kind of gives you the whole view of it. You can see, right, or at least the whole view of it on one side. Look how big that thing is. Trapezius is a large muscle. It goes from the base of your skull out to your shoulder and then all the way down to T12. All right, it's the most superficial back muscle. And you can see the fibers go in a bunch of different uh, directions here. So it has a lot of different movement patterns involved. All right, if you're a swimmer or you like to row a lot, this muscle here is going to be very well developed in you. This is the latissimus dorsi. If you like to do a lot of pull-ups, this muscle is the one that helps you do that significantly. Okay. Right here, this big kind of broad muscle. And then it actually will attach on to what we call the thoracodorsal uh, fascia here. All right, that's the latissimus dorsi. Don't write this on the test, but it's nicknamed the lats. I repeat, don't put that on the test. All right, your shoulder muscle. All right, is the deltoid muscle. This is that triangular shaped muscle that we saw all right, it is actually going to insert on the humerus on the deltoid tuberosity. So now you can see why we named it the deltoid tuberosity for the deltoid muscle to insert upon. All right, but this muscle gives you that nice rounded contour to, to your shoulder, and it helps to lift your arm away from your body. Now this is the deltoid muscle from the posterior view here. Now you can see it from the lat or, I'm sorry, the anterior view. Here it is from the front. Okay. And then I don't know what page this next model is, but it's the picture of the arm. So go back to where the extremities were. And this is the lateral view of the deltoid. So we have three different views for the deltoid muscle. Okay, so now I'd like to go into the deeper dissections of the back. So we're going to dissect away the trapezius muscle, and we're going to hang around the shoulder blades here. So you have two muscles that are associated with the shoulder blade, all right? And this lower muscle here, again, a rhomboid is the shape of the muscle, okay? Like a rhomboid, a four-sided uh, shaped structure, okay? And this muscle attaches this, the um, medial border here of the scapula to the upper thoracic vertebrae. All right, so this big guy here is the rhomboid major muscle. Remember, remember the, the rule, 
the minor is above the major. So the smaller one above that, that's going to be the rhomboid minor muscle. That's this little fella here. This muscle here, it's not labeled on this slide here, but this is the, the angle, this corner-like structure on the scapula. This muscle here, that's levator scapula. Okay, and then you can see this one here, this is splenius capitis. We, we labeled these on Tuesday. I'm just showing you, I'm showing it to you on this model. So levator scapula and then splenius capitis. So you can see, all right, that it inserts right here into the scapula, so when it contracts, it helps to lift up the scapula, so it elevates the scapula there. Okay, so we're going to switch back over to the more superficial side. All right, so here's the latissimus dorsi muscle, and this small muscle that's right above it, okay, that's your teres major muscle. Teres major. Now remember the rule, the minor's above the major. You can't see it, but I'll show it to you slightly. I am highlighting a little section there. That's the teres minor. Okay, tough to see, but the teres minor is just peeking out just a little bit in there. All right, let me show you teres major and a couple different other views here. Okay, the lighting's not the best on this picture here, but here's teres major right there. All right, teres major. And then one other one, because now we're going to flip the arm over, and we're going to show you teres major from the uh, medial side of the arm right here. So all we do, we're just looking at the inside of the arm. You can even see here on the big, on the big uh, zoomed out model, all right, we're on the inside of the arm. Okay, here's the palm. All right, and so here's teres major. I'm going to go back to the previous slide real fast. Right, so here it is here. Now we're just flipping it over, flipping the arm over. This is the um, lateral side or the outside here. You can see this is the back of the hand. Okay, so we have a muscle down here that attaches onto the ribs, okay, kind of lies over the erector spinae muscle down in the abdominal region here, in the thora lower thoracic region of the spine here. All right, and we call it serratus posterior, and... Um, for those of you that eat meat or like to cut things that might be a little bit hard to cut, it's always more beneficial to use a serrated knife edge. And that's the knife edge that looks jagged like this. So the reason why we call this muscle serratus is because where it inserts onto the ribs here, it's kind of jagged there. Okay. So that's serratus posterior muscle. Now, no, I'm not even going to say it. So now what we're doing is we're flipping you over and looking at you from the inside now. And you have this muscle group. Remember, we saw down in the abdomen, we saw the transversus abdominis muscle, and that was this muscle down here. Okay? Well, guess what? I know I'm in the abdomen because I don't see any ribs down here. But now, on this slide... I'm not in the abdomen anymore, all right? And I have these muscles that their fibers are going straight across here. They're transverse. But I have ribs present, okay? You can see the ribs are right here and here, okay? So I'm in the thoracic region. So that's why we call this the thoracis, excuse me, the transversus thoracis. So don't confuse that with the transversus abdominis. Easy way to remember, are there ribs in the vicinity immediately adjacent? If yes, transversus thoracis. If no, transversus abdominis. All right, let's go to the chest here. And this is that muscle that you'll see people working on when they're doing bench press or whatnot. Um, bodybuilders work on it all the time, the chest muscle. That's the pectoralis major muscle. 
All right, there is a pectoralis minor muscle that you don't have to uh, know, but it's deep to the pectoralis major muscle. Pectoralis minor is commonly what causes us to have hunched shoulders or what we call anterior shoulders when we have that slouching position. All right, here you can see serratus anterior. We saw serratus posterior in the back. This is serratus anterior in the front. Now, this gives you a much better uh, display of why we call it serratus because, again, where it inserts onto the ribs, it has a jagged-like edge like a serrated knife. Okay, that's my knife. <clears throat> okay, that's the serratus anterior muscle. Now, you don't have this slide in your book, but all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the model and I'm going to rotate it more so we can see the side a little bit better. And that's what we're seeing here. Okay, that is serratus anterior. All right, now you can see, or you probably noticed that we have muscles in between the ribs, so we give those a name. All right, these muscles that are a little bit more lateral, okay, you can really tell, but the fibers go down and in. Well, guess what other fibers went down and in? The external obliques. So these are in between the ribs, and those are, are costal, so we call these muscles the external intercostal muscles. Their fibers go down and in, and they're located more laterally. Okay, the ones that are located a little bit more medially, all right, well, here you can see the external intercostals, all right, a little bit better, but the ones that are located more medially and their fibers go up and in, like the internal oblique, so these muscle fibers, we would call them the internal intercostal muscles. One quick view here. There you can see it on the rotated model. All right, let's wrap up with the diaphragm. Okay, now before we saw it just as the diaphragm. But now we're going to talk about the different parts of the diaphragm. If the arrow is pointing to the red part, that represents muscle. So we therefore call it the muscular portion of the diaphragm. Okay, so when you're breathing, all right, when you take a breath in, when you inspire, all right, you contract that portion of the diaphragm. And that causes the diaphragm to flatten out. Normally it's like a dome. All right, the white part there, or gray part, whatever it looks more like to you, that's the central tendon. Muscles attach onto tendons. Okay, that's the central tendon. So there's actually three holes or openings. There's the obvious two, and then there's the third one, which is right over here. So we're going to label all those. Okay, the first one that's off that's off center. Okay, that is the caval hiatus. All right, the caval hiatus allows for the inferior vena cava to go from your abdomen up towards your heart. The inferior vena cava drains all the blood right, from your extremities um, and parts of the pelvis and the lower abdominal area. Okay. So the next hole there, right in the middle, is the esophageal hiatus. I don't think I need to tell you what travels through that. It's a secret. You can't know. No. I'm sure you can figure it out on your own, okay? Because if you recall, your stomach is below or inferior to your diaphragm. And actually, has anyone ever heard of a hiatal hernia? It's when part of the stomach will herniate up into the diaphragm, okay? And that's the hole that it goes through. That's the esophageal hiatus. So people complain of food regurgitation and whatnot. It's a possibility they might have a hiatal hernia. All right, 
And then our last one for tonight's um, labeling is the aortic hiatus. Okay, that is where all right the descending aorta all right travels through. When it's superior to the diaphragm, it's known as the thoracic descending aorta. When it's inferior to the diaphragm, then we call it the abdominal de descending aorta. All right, that is it for this segment. We have now completed the um, labeling for the axial skeleton. So it's not too bad. I highly urge you folks to really focus uh, this weekend. I, I know that you probably want to take a little bit of a break, but unfortunately you can't. You've got to keep pushing through. All right? But I would really highly urge you because to really nail all these slides for the axial skeleton. And, and, and um, or the axial muscles, and for the, the neuron. I think there's only, what, 17, 17 slides for the neuron or structures? So I would really work on that between now and Tuesday, okay? Just so, because we're going to, the appendicular uh, muscles, there's a, there's a few more, and they're a little bit more difficult to learn. You know a lot of them, all right? Um, any questions? No? All righty. Make sure that you sign the form. Anybody at home, do you have any questions for me? If you don't, I wish you a wonderful weekend, a very good night, and I will try to get your lab tests uh, graded ASAP, okay? As soon as I can. I've got three sections to grade this weekend. Um, thank you, Brian. Um, all righty. I'm going to shut this off so it can crash.